morning, Grace Warman. Welcome here this morning. I'm so glad you could uh, join us as we gather together today. If you're new here, my name is Mark. I am one of the pastors here, along with Clay and Jared, who will soon be a pastor here as well. Uh, his ordination service is April 2nd, as you saw on the um, announcement slide. Um, and if you've been with us over the past while, uh, you'll probably have realized by now that we spend the largest chunk of our time on a Sunday morning going through Scripture. And we do this because we believe that it's God's Word to us. And it's through this Word that uh, He has graciously given to us that we can know who God is in the best way possible. And so over the past while, we've been going through the book of Luke, and we started at the beginning of January, and we've been going through it uh, chapter by chapter and and verse by verse. And we do this uh, method most often because... It seems to be the best way to understand a particular passage within its context and just helps us to see the author's uh, intended uh, meaning and story and message most clearly. And so this morning, uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 3, and we will be taking uh, a pretty large chunk of Scripture today, verse 1 all the way to verse 20. And so if you turn there with me, uh, whether you have a paper copy or an app version of the Bible, either is fine with me. I think you'll find it super helpful to have it open in front of you uh, while we go through it. And if you have a paper copy of the Bible, you'll find the book of Luke roughly three-quarters of the way through the Bible in the New Testament section, right after the book of Mark and before uh, the book of John. And so if you see either of those two books, you're right right close to the right place. All right, so the the passage is going to be read out on the screen behind me, and then we're going to pray together after the passage is read out, and then we're going to go through it as the church. A reading from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor, and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. All right, before we go through this passage together, let's just uh, ask God for some wisdom. Heavenly Father, um, 
We pray this morning that as we go through uh, this gospel of Luke today, um, we ask for help and for wisdom and for guidance as we go through it, that you would just um, grant us the ability to see uh, what you have for us in this scripture, that we could know you and love you more deeply. We want to say thank you that there is this um, good news of the gospel for us and written for us. We, we thank you for this account of the gospel story, this good news story that you worked out for your people. And I think sometimes we forget uh, what good news it is that you came to save your people. We forget how sinful and messed up we were and we think we're good enough and this passage just kind of puts that all to rest. And so it shows us our great need for your salvation. And then it shows us the good news of you sending your son, a savior and a king. And so we thank you for this good news this morning. And I pray that it would change us into the people that you've called us to be today. A people humbled by your great love and by your sacrifice. I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so we're just going to jump right into this text this morning. Uh, verse 1 and the first half of verse 2, it says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Eteria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. So, there's a lot of strange names and places in there, uh, but... I, I'm starting to feel kind of like a broken record, uh, mostly because all these types of passages so far in the book of Luke have fallen to me to preach. And so once again here, in the beginning of chapter 3, Luke gives us the time and place of where this story is about to take place. In chapter 1, Luke kind of anchored the story uh, in history prior to the birth of Jesus, um, during the reign of King Herod, who ruled in Judea. And then in chapter 2, once again, he does the exact same thing. Right at the beginning of the chapter, he anchors the story of the birth of Jesus Christ in recorded history, again, during the reign of Caesar Augustus this time. In each chapter, he's been kind of moving through the historic narrative of Jesus coming to earth and living here. And so Luke gives the actual times and places of where this story of Jesus takes place. It's a real story. It took place during real times and real places. And the story of Jesus, it's not a uh, once upon a time in a land far away type of story. And so now in chapter 3, Luke does this for us one more time. Just in case his readers weren't totally convinced of the veracity of the story, he gives us the time and the place of this story so it can be verified by the history books that had been written. This would have likely been close to 30 years after the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus, but uh, Luke lets us know that if we connect it to uh, real recorded history, it would have taken place during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and it, he would have been the ultimate ruler over the Roman em em Empire, I guess, at that time. And under Caesar, Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. And also under Caesar were these tetrarchs, Herod, Philip, and Lysanias, and they were all sons of uh, the Herod that we read of in Luke chapter 1, who was around during the birth of Jesus. Herod the Great, who uh, was the father, had split up his territory into four regions, or you can say provinces if you want. Um, and ultimately, um, Herod's son Herod ended up with two of these provinces. Philip ended up with, uh, an, or sorry, <clears throat> Herod ended up with one, Philip ended up with two, and Lysanias ended up with another one. And so these three brothers were kind of ruling the Roman regions in the area. And as if that, this wasn't enough information to tie this story to the reality of history, Luke gives us two more men, um, Annas and Caiaphas, and they were the high priests of the day uh, during the time that our story takes place. And so Luke has given us the Roman rulers, and now he gives us the Jewish religious leaders of the day. Annas and Caiaphas. And this gives us this picture that this passage is written for everyone. For the Jews, it was anchoring it in Jewish recorded religious history during the time when these two men were high priests. And this would have been significant because there was really only supposed to be one high priest according to Jewish law. Now, according to Jewish law or Old Testament law, uh, being appointed 
a high priest was generally a lifetime appointment. It was supposed to be hereditary. You were born into the priestly line, and it was Annas who was uh, a priest at the time. However, uh, the Jews being under Roman rule and being oppressed by the Romans, uh, the Romans had actually removed him from his high priesthood and put his son-in-law, Caiaphas, in place, uh, in place of Annas. So essentially you had uh, the father-in-law who was the Jewish high priest and still viewed by many of the Jews during that time, or maybe even all of them, to be the true high priest. And then you had the son-in-law, Caiaphas, um, who was the high priest uh, of record, so to speak, according to the Romans. Uh, so he was kind of viewed as high priest by uh, the Gentiles, you could say. And so you had this two-tier system, or two-high priest system, which was kind of weird at the time. And so we get all this treasure of information from Luke because he wants everyone to know that this story is true and it, it's historic and it's real. He has the historic uh, or the historical Roman leaders and the historical uh, Jewish leaders, so that no matter which side of the political or religious spectrum you are on whether you were Jewish or non-Jew or anyone from the known world, you would have the ability to verify these facts from your own historical accounts. Luke chapter 1, 2, and 3 all have these anchors to history because it's important for you to know the truth uh, of this gospel message. It's real, it's true, it's verifiable, and Luke wanted his audience to know this. And it is important to know that it's real and true because of what follows in the rest of this book. If the story that follows is real, it has massive implications for our lives. And if this story is real, then the verses that follow this morning ought to make us pause and consider them seriously. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to go through them. And so it's during this time in history that we enter the last half of verse 2 and verse 3. It says, The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. So, back in chapter 1 again, we saw this older couple who couldn't have children. They were told by an angel that they would have a boy in their old age, and he would have the Holy Spirit upon him, and that he would be cut out for a certain mission. And, well, this boy, he was born in chapter 1, and then we hear nothing about him until uh, he is now an adult um, likely almost 30 years old or so, something like that. And he is in the wilderness where God gives him a message for his people. And we really know nothing about why he was in the wilderness. We just know that he was. His dad was a priest. His parents lived in the hill country of Judea in a town. And so for some reason, John ended up in the desert by God's plan. He wasn't uh, your typical type of guy who's trying to climb the social ladders. <laughs> the Gospels of Matthew and Mark both give us this picture of someone who is sort of a caveman-looking dude. He wore a, a coat of camel's hair. He had a leather belt. He ate locusts and, and wild honey and, and all these strange uh, things about him uh, that we see. They actually point us back to the Old Testament. Uh, if these crowds were up on their Old Testament scriptures and, and their Jewish history, they would have been able to see some th interesting things about this strange, weird guy. They might have been able to connect some dots from history to present day. The, the locust he ate, you know, it could have been a reminder to the crowds of the locusts of the plagues of, in, in Egypt during the Old Testament, which were this, really this warning to flee, that this wrath that was coming where all the firstborn would die with, if you didn't have the blood uh, of the lamb on the doorposts and on the lintel. And, and, and so it would sort of have been a reminder to them, and the honey could have been a reminder of, of the promised land that the, that the Israelites had been promised that was flowing with milk and honey, and the coat of camel's hair and his belt would have been a reminder of them that he's just like this guy in the Old Testament, this Elijah, who was preparing the way for the Lord. It's the same outfit we see Elijah wear in 2 Kings, the Old Testament prophet Malachi, he, he, and he describes John as this Elijah who is to come. And so the signs were all there if the, if the crowds could understand, uh, understand them. This was a prophet that was sent by God predicted and foreshadowed in the Old Testament. His message was this, God has come to earth as a man and his ministry is about to begin, so repent of your sin and prepare yourselves for his coming. And Luke shows us that this John the Baptist character, he was 
who the Old Testament prophet Isaiah was also talking about when he said this in verses 4, 5, and 6. He says this, As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So, Not only was this story anchored in real history, but it was predicted hundreds of years earlier throughout the Old Testament by the prophet Isaiah and by others that this story wasn't just coincidence. It was fully planned by God. Sending Jesus to earth to save his people was always the plan. And that was how he always planned to do it. It wasn't plan B. God is faithful to do what he says he will do, and he will do it. So hundreds of years earlier, Isaiah had reminded the captive and oppressed and struggling Old Testament Jews that a Savior was coming, and there would be one who would come before this Jesus to prepare the way. And ultimately, it would be all flesh, Isaiah says, that would see the salvation of the Lord. It would not just be the Jews, but it would be Jews and Gentiles. That's what he means by all flesh. All tribes, all nations, all languages, all the diversity of the human race would see God's salvation according to verse 6. And now Luke shows us that this John guy, this John the Baptist in the wilderness, he was the one who was preparing the way for this Savior to come so that all the peoples would be able to witness the salvation of God. And he would prepare the hearts of the people by what he said for the coming Jesus. And his message was basically, turn from your sin, the Messiah is coming. And verse 3 says this about what John was doing in the wilderness, and it says he went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so John, he's out in the desert preaching to people that they were sinners, meaning they had rebelled against God and they needed to repent of their sin and their rebelling, meaning that they, repenting meaning that they need to turn from their sinful ways, turn from their rebellion, and, and turn back to God for the forgiveness of sin. And now, before the birth of John, there was this, this angel had told John's dad, Zechariah, that his son's ministry would be to turn many people to the Lord their God. And so you get this picture that John's message of repentance is this turning away from sin and turning to God. And I, I, I kind of like how the King James Version words, verse 3, a little better. John was preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, it states in the King James Version. It just gives us this picture that is a little bit clearer of what repentance does to us. It uses this word remission. Now, kind of like uh, when you go for cancer treatment, and, and once all the treatment is done, you hope that the cancer is gone and that it's in full remission. The signs and the symptoms of the cancer are gone. The cancer, it technically still lurks in the background, threatening to pounce, but, it, but it's now in remission. That's the hope. And, and that's really what repentance is for, so that the signs and the symptoms of our sin are reduced or gone. And, and while we live here in this world as it is today, sin's always there in the background. It can always flare up. It's always looking to take us. But that's what repentance is for. We repent, and it's fighting against sin so that the sin doesn't take us down a dark path. And John didn't hold back on educating these people on what kind of dark path their sin could take them down. He, he educated them on their dire sinful situation. He had to be blunt, just like a doctor has to be blunt and honest about a diagnosis of cancer. Because if the message is true, it can have some massive implications. In verses 7 to 9, he says this, he he said, therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, he says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So there are these massive crowds coming out from the towns and the cities and the regions around him, and his message isn't some fluff piece. It's not some feel-good message of you are good enough, all you need is you, you can do it, you just need to believe in yourself. 
No, his message was this. God is coming to save his people, so repent of your sin and turn to him. Believe in him, not in yourself. And, and when they had repented of their sin, he would baptize them in water, meaning he would, he would immerse them or dunk them under the water in the river. Now, as a Jew, to be baptized would have been quite scandalous. In the Jewish culture, there were only uh, the people, only people that wanted to become Jews that weren't born into Jew- Judaism, they would become baptized into the Jewish religion. If you were born a Jew, you were, you were already in by birth. There was no need for baptism for you. Now, many who were coming out to hear John, or most, most of them, uh, would have been Jews. And they hear this message from him that they need to repent of their sin and turn to God, and they get baptized. And this would have been unheard of. But some, now especially the, the Jewish religious leaders, they had come out to see John uh, with no intentions of repent, repenting of their sin. And so John calls them out, and he calls them a brood of vipers, a, a bunch of snakes. And he knows that they're trusting in the fact that they were born Jewish, that they were in the line of Abraham, in verse, according to verse 8. They were God's chosen people, and they were trusting in that for salvation from their sin. So John lets them know plainly that someone who is truly a child of God, someone who is truly in God's family, they live a life of repentance, and they turn to God for their salvation. They cannot count on their heritage, their history, their good works for their salvation. Being Jew will not save you. John's message is plain. If you truly love God and are called into his kingdom, then your life will be a life of repentance and turning from sin and running to God. It doesn't matter if you grew up in the church. It doesn't matter if your parents were Christians. It doesn't matter if your dad was a pastor, your mom was a, a Sunday school teacher, or it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much uh, good works you do, what kind of philanthropy you do. Uh, the mark of a true lover of God is someone who repents from their sin, who turns from their sin and runs to Jesus. Now, even though most of them didn't know who Jesus was yet. Now, John tells them that just because you're an Israelite doesn't mean you're a true Israelite or a true chosen one. God can raise up people from rocks, and so your heritage, your faith in your family line means nothing. That's John's message to them. God can make true believers out of stones. In other words, he can make anyone his child from anywhere, from any tribe, from any nation. He can make the heart of stone become a heart of flesh. And so he doesn't need the Jewish religious leader's false sense of piety and their faith in their family line or in their good works. God can and will save whomever he pleases. And whoever lives a life of repentance, whoever feels that living a life of... uh, or sorry, whoever lives a life of unrepentance or... Whoever feels that living a life of sin is okay because of what I am or who I am or what I do, John clearly states that the axe is laid at the root of that tree, so to speak. In other words, they're going to experience the wrath of God for their sin. The unrepentant sin is proof that they do not love God. And they're not part of God's family, even if they think they are. And that's a scary thought. And they will suffer the punishment for their unrepentant sin. And if this message is true, and we believe it to be, then we have some serious implications for us, just like it did for the crowd that John was speaking to. So what does it mean for us? What does being a part of God's kingdom mean for us? If we're a part of God's family, what will this life of repentance look like for us? Well, fortunately for us today, the crowd that John was speaking to had the exact same question, verses 10 to 14, and the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share it with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teachers, or teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. And the soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be content with your wages. Basically, John's telling them exactly how to repent. Stop doing the things you were doing and start doing those things that you weren't doing. This is the life of repentance. Start living, stop living a life of selfishness and start sacrificing yourself for others. Basically, he says you're living, 
in sinful and selfish disobedience to God and who he has called you to be. And so change what you do to reflect what you believe about who you are. Not as a way of salvation, this won't save you, but as a token or as proof of your salvation. You say you're a part of God's family, then show it. You cannot rely on your ancestry or your family line. Your actions are going to show who you really are and if you have indeed been made part of God's family. Instead of selfishly keeping everything you have for yourself, be generous. Give the cloak off your back for someone who might need it. Give extra food or wages to someone who might need it. If you work for the CRA, then don't collect more tax than you're supposed to. If, if you're in a position of power, don't accept bribes. God is a generous God and a sacrificial God, and, and he was about to sacrifice his son so that all different people groups could be saved. And so we ought to live a life of sacrificial, repentant generosity as a picture of God's sacrificial generosity towards us. So the world around us can experience God's love through his people. God is a just God, and so we ought to deal justly and honestly with others, not taking more than we ought to and not perverting justice for money. This gives the world around us a clear picture of God's justice. Sinners will have to justly pay for their sin unless the Son of God, Jesus Christ, pays for it on their behalf. And so this life of repentance and living as Jesus calls us to live in the New Ten Testament ought to show the world around us a picture of who Jesus is by how we live. A life of repentance is not just stopping doing the bad we were doing, but doing the opposite good as well. Not for our salvation, but because of it. Many of these people to whom John was speaking had put their hope in the fact that they were descended from Abraham. That they were Jewish. They were chosen by God. They were already in the family. But John's helping these people to see that they were living in a way that denied who they said they really were. They said they followed God, yet they rebelled against him. And so their rebellion, their, their sin, actually showed their true identity. If we live a life of repentance, it shows the world around us that we are indeed a part of God's kingdom. We are a people that have been given so much, and it changes how we live in the here and now. Now, it seems as though there were many, when John was preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit, who heard the message of John and repented of their sin, and they were baptized in the river. And they knew that there was something special about this John the Baptist, and it says that they wondered if maybe he was the Messiah that was to come, if maybe he was the Christ. Verse 15 tells us that this crowd is it's in expectation. They're waiting for a Savior. They're expecting one. They had heard over the last few hundred years that a Christ would come. And the way that John preached and, and what he said made them think that this John guy might be it. He just might be the one. Verses 15 to 17, as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them and says, answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, John immediately shuts down any talk that he might be the Christ. He's like, hey, I'm baptizing with water, but the one to come, the Savior, the Messiah, the one you're expecting, the one that's coming very shortly, he is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, this might sound a little crazy to you, and that's, that's fine because I'm pretty sure John sounded crazy to the crowd as well, but what does John mean when he says that this person that's going to come after him is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire? Well, John is baptizing with water, and he, he did this for anyone who repented of their rebellion against God, and the, and the word baptize means to immerse, and so this was John's baptism water. Anyone who repented of their sin went under the water and came back up. Kind of a symbol of dying to the sin, going underwater, being washed clean, and rising to life. And John's message to those who were out in the wilderness with him is that if you're a member of God's family, and it shows by the fruit in your life, by your repentance, that you are indeed in God's family, then you will one day be baptized with the Holy Spirit, meaning you're going to be filled 
with the Holy Spirit. I like to think of it us like cups. If you baptize a cup or immerse it in water, it comes up full of water. It's kind of like when we believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, John tells the crowd that there's coming a man and he's so great, he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. He's going he's, to, for those that repent and believe in him, he's going to fill the people, fill you with the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what happened. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to fill each and every believer so that if we trust in the death and the resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sin, in our repentance, and and if our repentance of sin shows that we truly do believe in Jesus and what he has done for us, then we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are baptized by the Holy Spirit. We are immersed and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And we, as as a New Testament church, we baptize with water those who profess faith in Jesus. The outward baptism of water is an indication of the inward baptism that's already taken place. Our sins have been washed out. We have died to them. We have been filled with the, the life of the Holy Spirit, with God himself in us. This is the good news. And the exciting baptism that John proclaims will come for those who believe in the one who is coming, the one that is mightier than he. Now, John also says there's going to be another baptism. This Messiah is coming. Jesus Christ will come with a winnowing fork. And a winnowing fork is kind of like a pitchfork, if you know what that is. It's designed to separate. And Jesus will come and separate those who are his, the wheat in verse 17, and those who are not his, the chaff in verse 17. And so the the chaff, those who do not believe in Jesus, those who are not his, those who are not repentant, will also get baptized or submerged, but not with the Holy Spirit, but with, into unquenchable fire, John says. So you get the picture of this terrible punishment of wrath being submerged or immersed in unquenchable fire for those who are not part of God's eternal kingdom. John's trying to get the message across that your sin problem is bigger than you thought it was. It's rooted even deeper than you thought, and you need a Savior to help you sort out this sin problem Because there is coming a time when Jesus comes and he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's going to separate those who are his and those who are not. And so repent. The Savior's coming and he will gather the repentant sinner into his safety, into his home, into his kingdom, into his barn. The unrepentant sinner will suffer justly for what they have done in their rebellion against God. So so this is serious. This is real. And it's coming and everyone gets a baptism in a sense some with the Holy Spirit and some with fire. John's not messing around here. This is reality. The funny thing is, though, that this ultra bad news that we deserve to suffer the punishment for our sins, it's what makes the good news so good. So so for those who are a part of the family of God, those who have repented and turned to Jesus and who trust in him, who have faith in him for the forgiveness of sin, and for the forgiveness of our rebellion against the perfect and powerful God, we get eternity with Jesus. Jesus has sent his spirit to live in us as a seal or as a guarantee that he will do as he said he will do, and he will bring us into his safety. Verse 18 says, So with many other exhortations, he preached the good news to the people. So John continued to preach the good news urgently to this people. Jesus is coming. The Son of God is coming to earth. So repent of your sin. He's coming to take away your worst nightmare, the payment for your sin. There's no better news than this. And so the last two verses of our text say this, verse 19 and 20. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. And that's all we get about John's ministry from the author Luke. John had reprimanded Herod for hooking up with his brother's wife, and so Herod didn't like that, and he imprisoned John for calling out his wrongdoing. John was never released from prison and would later be beheaded by Herod at the behest of Herod's new wife. John fulfilled the mission that God had for him here on this earth. He had a message of repentance. His reminder to everyone was that we were sinners in need of a Savior, and that Savior is now coming. 
So repent of your sin, run to Jesus. He offers you freedom from that sin. And we all need the reminder of John the Baptist sometimes. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. Sometimes we forget that, and it can be too easy to remember only how, how good we are. <laughs> we think only affirming thoughts or try to increase our self-esteem by pumping our own tires and our own abilities, and we think that surely God will save me. I've tried so hard. And this is exactly how the Jewish leaders thought. And John just reminds them, hey, if you don't turn away from sin and turn to Jesus, there's no salvation for you. Salvation can be found in Jesus and Jesus alone, in one greater than us. Your status, your heritage, your history, your family line, your money, your good works, your efforts, they're not safety for you. None of them can do what Jesus is going to do for you. None of them can pay the price for your sin. So turn to him, trust in him. He will bring you into his kingdom. And this is the good news, isn't it? We look to Jesus and he saves us. It is nothing more than faith in him that saves us. No matter where we come from, no matter what we've done, he is our only hope. The seriousness of our sin problem ought to also help us comprehend the greatness of our salvation. And what a great salvation Jesus has bought for us and led us into a life of repentance from sin and closeness to him. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today knowing our sin is our biggest problem. Our rebellion towards you is what is our greatest despair. But sometimes the gravity of that gets lost on us, and so would you help us to see our sin for what it is, for the nastiness that it is, for how terrible it is, and for the cost that we could bear because of it. And then show us your salvation in all your glory so that our hope and our worship and our love for you, what you have done just kind of grows into this rock-solid faith in you, trust in you, and joy in you. Please help us to understand the seriousness of this and the truth of your word that you have given us today. That we would run from our rebellion and run back to you with all our enthusiasm and effort today. Pray this in your name. Amen.